You're watching the nation's best college newscast. 11 News at Noon starts now. Bullies in Hiding, how an Instagram account at Tempe High School may get some students in a lot of trouble. Food bank needs. Food stamp numbers are down in Utah County, but the food bank says that's not necessarily a good thing. And it's Columbus Day, how America is celebrating the Explorer even during the government shutdown. I'm Mark Chalice. And I'm Randall Vaudry. Welcome to 11 News at Noon. Bullies are using the internet to hide while openly attacking others online. That's right. It's, not an, it, it's a nationwide problem, but now it's hitting close to home. Police say a cyberbully hit Provost Timview High School hard this week using social media as a tool for harassment. 11 News reporter Aubrey Jones spoke with Provo Police. Aubrey, what's happening at Timview? Well, bullying isn't a new thing, but now it's being taken to the internet where it can be stored and saved forever. Police say Timview High experienced this in full force when a bully took to a popular social site to torment students. Parents, my report has a few graphic terms in it, so you may want to shield the children in the room. Police say Timview High School girls were the target of a list on the popular social media picture sharing site Instagram. The unknown creator of the list calls it the whore list and posted sexually derogatory comments and pictures of around 30 girls. Instagram took the page down after the school resource officer found it, but not before it had already spread to hundreds of students. This type of bullying is no different than a bully in the hallway who pushes and grabs somebody and hurts somebody. It's exactly the same. In fact, I would say it's probably could be even worse. Police say Timpview isn't the only school that suffers from bullying. Every school has it in one form or another. The problem is these emotional scars are now broadcast for the world to see. The negative belief they take about themselves stays with them throughout their life. Gardner encourages parents to talk to their kids and teach them a few simple steps in order to protect themselves. Teach them to stand strong, strong you know, body posture, and to practice saying back off or um, leave me alone or don't touch me and to teach them to go get help. Teachers, school counselors, and other faculty members encourage students to tell them if they feel bullied. Police still don't know who the cyberbully is, but they are working with local attorneys on the case to see if there are charges they can press when they do find out. So if there's no charges they can press, what happens then? Well, if there aren't any charges, the school is the only one that can take disciplinary measures, and it's only they can only take it if it is a student of the school. All right. Thanks, Aubrey. Thanks. Parents who want to protect their kids against cyberbullying need to look beyond just Facebook and Twitter. Officials say cyberbullying is a problem on several apps and social media websites, including Ask.fm and Kick, where users can make anonymous posts. Bullies can also use Snapchat, where a picture disappears after a few seconds, leaving no evidence behind. <laughs> Representatives from these companies say they have updated safe their safety rights and offer parent guides to fight against bullying. A new study says Utah County and the world's air quality has improved in the past 10 years. The report says the count Utah County's air quality has steadily improved since scientists first started measuring it back in 1958. A BYU professor and a team of nearly 500 scientists spent more than 10 years measuring air pollution levels in dozens of countries. The Utah State Bar has closed one of its two cases against embattled Attorney General John Swallow. The bar was investigating him for viola violations of professional conduct, but dropped the one case after the U.S. Department of Justice cleared him. Swallow's office made the announcement. The state bar is still investigating improper fundraising and deal-making charges. Each day, a quarter million Utahns rely on food stamps to feed their families, but they may be losing some of that assistance soon. 11 News reporter Shalise Kofed tells us what the changes mean for the people of Utah County. Economic hardships have hit some Utah homes hard, but pocketbooks are about to get even tighter. Struggling food stamp users are looking for additional ways to feed their families. A temporary increase in food stamp funding from Congress expires the 1st of November. Brian Mark Carlisle is already struggling to put food on the table and says the government is dead wrong to let impoverished families like his lose the support they rely on. I mean, the people, they shouldn't have to endure this. After all, such as myself, I've paid taxes over 31 years now. And to see this happen after I've been supporting what I believe will continue is wrong. Food banks are there for additional help for families like Carlisle's. Food banks say they are expecting added strain at the end of the month and have already started seeing an increase in customers. People are starting to get jobs, but they're still not paying enough um, for them to really 
support their family and so they're still needing assistance. So we help those individuals. Diviny says food banks across the nation are strained with increasing numbers, but that the Provo community does a great job of keeping their neighbors fed. With the holiday season just around the corner, Community Action Services says they need every can people are willing to spare. We're always encouraging volunteers to donate food, donate their time, and, and give back to those who really need it. The government shutdown is causing the Women, Infants, and Children Nutrition Program to take funding cuts at the end of this month as well. This could leave even more struggling families looking for food bank help. Randall? Thanks, Jalise. You know not to fill your car up with the wrong kind of gas, but what if the gas gets mixed up, mixed up at the gas station? Many people in Tooele are having car troubles after filling up at the holiday oil there. They claim they got diesel fuel when they were using the unleaded pump. Most of the pumps at the station are now closed, and neither the manager or the company have commented on it yet. Police had no idea a disturbance call they received would literally end in a train wreck in Salt Lake City on Sunday. After getting the call, police chased a female driver. She ran into a railroad crossing, hitting a train on 2600 South. As officers tried to get her out of the car, a second train hit. Police say the woman has non-life-threatening injuries. They're still investigating the reasoning behind the call and the chase. Still to come on your 11 News at noon, going on free. It's been a full two weeks since the government shutdown. Congress is talking, but will their actions speak louder than their words? And interstate emergency. An eight-year-old girl's quick thinking saves her mother's life at 80 miles per hour. Stay with us. We'd just like to make a correction from our last story. That train accident actually occurred in Woods Cross, not in Salt Lake City, and we apologize about that. Moving on, while state governors are making compromises to get parks up and running, it's a completely different story for Washington lawmakers. Even with the looming debt ceiling, no significant progress has been made to get the government back on its feet. Andrew Spencer tells us about the ongoing debate in Washington. Three of the most iconic places in the United States reopen as more states agree to take over the daily costs for sites run by the federal government. Sites closed during the government shutdown. Along with Mount Rushmore and the Grand Canyon, visitors return to the Statue of Liberty, where New York has agreed to pay more than $60,000 a day to generate nearly six times that in economic activity. Meanwhile, in Washington, the Senate chaplain asking for divine intervention. Give our lawmakers the wisdom to trust you and each other. Monday marks day 14 of the government shutdown, and while there is a lot of talk about talk on Capitol Hill... I've had a productive conversation with the Republican leader this afternoon. Our discussions were substantive, and we'll continue those discussions. Those conversations have so far left lawmakers in the same place. Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid says Republicans are still treating reopening the government as a concession. Democrats demanding a clean bill that funds the government and raises the debt ceiling, no strings attached. Senate Republicans blocked such a measure this weekend, and House Republican leaders say the president has rejected their proposal for a six-week extension of the debt ceiling. I'm Andrew Spencer reporting. In Utah alone, Governor Gary Herbert has struck deals with Washington to open up Utah's five national parks. He says he hopes that Washington can pull it together because national parks are often the backbone of many rural economies. <clears throat> Protesters in Pennsylvania run through the closed Valley Forge National Park. A girl saves her mother's life by calling 911 in Colorado and Columbus Day celebrations are going on in New York. Here's your look at news from across the nation. It seems the longer the shutdown lasts, the angrier Americans are getting. People in Pennsylvania held a protest after runners got fined $100 for jogging through the closed Valley Forge National Historic Park. Calling the event the protest, they're calling the event the protest run to draw attention to the shutdown and their desire to have the park reopened. Imagine driving 80 miles per hour down the highway and suddenly you can't control your body. That's exactly what happened as his Denver mom and daughter were out running errands. The two had been out all day when suddenly a migraine combined with temporary paralysis left the mom's only seconds to react. After safely pulling over, the eight-year-old daughter called 911 and both are safe now. And in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. The 69th Columbus Day Parade in New York celebrated with a wreath-laying ceremony at Columbus Circle in a march down Fifth Avenue. 
Organizers say the celebration isn't just for Columbus's journey, but also for all people who made their way to America. More than 35,000 people participated in today's, to, in today's march. And that's your look at news from across the nation. Randall? Thanks, Mark. Well, Kathleen, I forgot my umbrella today, so I'm hoping it's not supposed to rain anymore. Yeah, you should be fine for today. However, you might need your umbrella later tonight. I'll let you, more with, I'll let you know more with 11 weather when we return. Happy Columbus Day, everyone. Today it's actually a pretty nice, nice blue day, nice blue sky going on, happening around here. And then we even have some more colors going on. As you can see right here, the leaves, we got some nice orange and some nice red here right behind me. And hopefully those leaves will fall down because I want to make a leaf angel in the leaf pile. However, right now in Provo, it is about 48 degrees. So it's a little bit chilly. And then the humidity is about 71%, which is a little high for right now in Provo because however that's a little bit of a precursor for what's going to happen tonight as we experience some as we go into tonight it'll be about 36 degrees and likely some showers as we go into the evening and that'll happen later on tonight as well and as the sun goes down at 6:45 at 6:47 p.m. but that's we'll worry about the rain as we get as we go on later today however the rest of the state we kind of live in two different states here here in utah southern utah it's nice bright and sunny as like in st george and cedar city and even in moab it's actually kind of actually even in like places like moab and price it's actually kind of nice going on we have some nice breezes going on however northern utah is a little bit of a different story here it's kind of rainy here and we're going to be expecting some rain here in provo and salt lake and even in logan we're looking out for some showers and every every pretty much every city in northern Utah will be experiencing a little bit of rain today except for Wendover. Wendover is going to be getting some nice sunshine here. So why don't we take the sunshine a little bit from Wendover. Have the, I kind of want them to share the sunshine with the rest of northern Utah. However, as we go back down to southern Utah, not much of a weather change here going on in southern Utah. 68 degrees on Monday and Tuesday and then it'll warm back up to a nice 69 degrees and then the rest of and then the rest of the week, we will be in the 70s. And then with the evening, pretty much all throughout the week being in the, being in the 40s. And it'll be sunny and clear. So if you want to go stargazing at night, I highly recommend it. And then northern Utah, a little bit of a different story here happening in northern Utah. Rain on Monday and Tuesday and, the, and a little bit cooler. It's definitely not as warm as it is in southern Utah. It's a little bit cooler with the temperatures being in the 50s and on Thursday on starting on Wednesday. Luckily on Tuesday, on Monday and Tuesday, the rain isn't going to last forever as the clouds will open up on Wednesday and we'll have a little bit more rain, a uh, little bit more sunshine happening. You know, the nice thing about all of this rain is the fall leaves, I swear they've been like brighter this year. It's great. Yeah, it really is. It makes it very colorful and I love color. So yeah, it's been nice up in the canyons. Yeah. Thanks, Kathleen. Yeah. All right, well, Skylar, this weekend I saw Cody Hoffman. He was diving into a beautiful catch in the end zone. I loved it. Yeah, I mean, that's something like Kathleen said. She wants to dive into those leaves. Cody looks great doing it in wonderful fall football. We'll talk about all of the homecoming activities, as well as the rambling wreck. Georgia Tech comes to town looking to spoil homecoming for the Cougs, but can they pull it off? And also the daunting daunts. Women's volleyball puts their perfect conference record on the line hosting San Francisco. Sports is coming your way after this break. Stay with us. BYU homecoming took off well before the battle on the gridiron Saturday. 11 sports reporter Kylie Patton was at the festivities to see just how the fans get hyped up before a big game. Tradition, spirit, and honor were more than just words on the back of the players' jerseys. All three played a part in the many events that took place this weekend as fans came out to show their support and, above all, have fun. Blue pancakes, cougar runs, and dancing in the streets. Nothing brings cougar crazies out more than homecoming traditions. There was no time to sleep in on Saturday as fans swarmed BYUSA-sponsored breakfast stations where the flapjacks reflected how loyal, strong, and blue fans are as they staked out their spot for the day's parade. I wear pajamas and give free pancakes whenever I possibly can. Fans say they loved coming out for breakfast as it helps them to feel a part of something bigger. Not to mention, eh, it tasted pretty good. They taste like candy. They taste great. 
Fans who prefer to burn their carbs rather than eat them raced against each other in the Cougar 5K run. The top overall finisher crossed the finish line at 15 minutes and 49 seconds. Cassie Harmon was the top women's finisher. She says she can't wait for next year's race. It's just kind of a tradition, tradition run. The homecoming parade kicked off at 10 o'clock with fans lining the streets to catch a glimpse of local and campus groups dancing through Provo. Oh, they're passing out candy. It was super fun. It was super fun to like see all the little kids and, um, I don't know, interact with the crowd. It wouldn't be homecoming without some football. Fans ended their celebrations by heading over to the stadium for some tailgating before cheering on their Cougars. Earlier on in the week, fans got down and dirty while playing with blue foam, and others attended homecoming spectacular performance at the Marriott Center all leading up to Saturday's game. Skyler? Thanks, Kylie. BYU hosted the 3-2 and two Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets for the big homecoming bout. We've seen that the fans were ready for some football, so let's find out if the team was. The Cougars handled the Ramble and Rec last year in Atlanta, and they struck first this year. Less than five minutes into the game, Taysom Hill finds plenty of time in the pocket before finding Cody Hoffman in the end zone. That diving touchdown is pretty awesome. Let's take another look at it. Hoffman is now the all-time reception leader at BYU. But Georgia Tech answered quickly. This bad lead pass, defensive pass interference, doesn't bother the receiver there. And then from the two-yard line, Lee carries it in himself. Looks like this one might turn into a shootout still in the first quarter. Jamal Williams gets into the end zone for the first time this season. Last year he torched Tech, and on Saturday he averaged 5.1 yards a carry. Let's get some defense. Of course, Kyle Van Noy comes up with a sack in the first quarter, and now here in the second quarter, sack number two. KVN is now just four sacks away from becoming the Cougars' all-time leader. With an 11-point advantage in the fourth, Alani Fua puts the game on ice. This pick six, man, the linebacker has never looked so fast. The INT and two solo tackles earned him Independent Defensive Player of the Week honors. The Cougs finished the homecoming celebration with a 38-20 win. One popular alum that didn't make it back to Provo this weekend was wide receiver Austin Cauley. He was busy out in the Northeast playing the first pro football game since week three of last year. The Patriots signed him just 11 days ago. He wears number 10 in these highlights and came in during the fourth quarter of the Saints-Pats game last night. He had two catches on New England's game-winning drive. One, this one right here, kept the drive alive. That was on fourth down. Now we'll just get a chance to see if his role can expand next week when the Patriots play the New York Jets. The other homecoming game this weekend was in the Smithfield House. Women's volleyball hosted a conference foe in the University of San, San Francisco on Saturday. The Cougars were looking to set the tone for the football game. Number 15, Tamber Haddock, and number 9, Alexa Gray, are gaining a reputation around the WCC, and matches like this are the reason. Hit, the hitting duo fired at the Dons all night long. Gray strikes first, and then you see a kill there from Tamber Haddock on the other side of the net. The Cougars eked out the first set 29 to 27. Then Katla Sheminar puts the cap on the second set, but it was Gray and Haddock all night. They combined for 31 kills and four blocks. That's a deadly duo. The Cougs sweep the Dons, winning the set two, winning sets two and three, 25 to 15. San Fran finishes themselves off with that service error, and BYU improves to seven and zero in conference play. 7 no, that's pretty good. Good for them. Pretty good. One other little bit of news. The Utah Jazz point guard drafted in the first round, you know, in the top 15. Trey Burke broke his finger this weekend and will be out at least eight weeks. Oh, Sad man. news. Bad news. Thanks, Skyler. Still to come on 11 News at Noon. Popping the question. The Living Dead were part of this haunted proposal. One couple with a creepy engagement story when we come back. Arizona boyfriend used the living dead to help make his marriage proposal one to die for. Nick Showman took his girlfriend through a haunted house and when they made it to the 13th floor, zombies attacked, trapping them on a bridge. A perfect time to pop the question apparently. That's right. 
Stephanie Hill said yes, and she took the ring offered by a severed arm. The couple then ran as the zombies chased them out of the room. Romantic stuff. She seemed to think so and says it was the best way to get engaged. Well, I guess that's the best way to get engaged for some people. I don't know. If, I don't know about me, though. <laughs> yep. I think it would work for me. Definitely I'd like that. interesting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's Eleven funny. News at noon for Monday, October fourteenth. You can join us anytime on our website, elevennews.byu.edu. Thanks for watching. Watch out for zombies and have a great afternoon. <laughs> Everywhere.